Wikipedia defines a crossover vehicle as a vehicle built on a car platform and combining, in highly variable degrees, features of an SUV with features from a passenger vehicle, especially those of a station wagon or hatchback. We say a crossover is a new family truckster. So without further delay, here's a list of TFL's favorite small and off-road worthy crossovers that we've driven in 2011. This is Roman Micah, and this is a Suzuki SX4. It's one of the smallest all-wheel drive cars you can buy. And like many new crossovers, it's really not meant to go off-road, at least not this kind of off-road. I am gonna take this car as far as I can today up what to you might seem like an easy trail, but in reality is a hardcore Jeep trail, one of the hardest in Colorado. Luckily, this car has three different drive modes. Let me show you what I mean. It's got two-wheel drive, auto, and lock. What that means is in two-wheel drive, obviously, it's front-wheel drive. In auto, up to 95% of the power goes to the front wheels, but it can allocate up to 50% to the rear wheels. And in lock, it locks the differential 50-50%. So we're gonna go up this hill, first in two-wheel drive, then in auto, and then in lock, and see how far we go before we get stuck. Okay, as you can tell, I am in two-wheel drive right now, and let's see how far I can get up this hill in two-wheel drive. Now keep in mind, this first part is easy, but it gets a lot harder, as you can tell by the dirt bike coming down, as we get farther. about as far as I can get up the trail in two-wheel drive, so I'm going to switch into auto mode. That means up to 95% of the power goes to the front wheels, but it can't allocate 50% to the rear wheels when needed. So let's try this in auto mode and see if I can make it up this hill. All right, that's auto mode, all-wheel drive, no problem. No problem at all. And in this kind of light, easy-going stuff, this uh, Suzuki works really well. But once again, it's hard to show on video, but this hill gets a lot steeper as you go higher. In fact, it becomes a dirt bike and a Jeep trail the farther up we go. And it's starting to get a little bit dicier. You can tell that there's a lot more rocks that are outcropping. And I'm starting to really worry about this car's ground clearance. So far, the Suzuki's done okay through the mud and through the water, but this right up here is where it gets serious. It's hard to show on video, but this is where the Jeeps and the dirt bikes really come into their own, and this is where the Suzuki's gonna have problems. So I'm gonna put it in all-wheel drive, I'm gonna lock the differential and see if I can make it up this hill, but I'm afraid that any higher than that is gonna be trouble. Let's give it a shot. That was bad, that was bad. Uh, we just hit something with the bottom of this car. And uh, let's see, hopefully we're not, uh, we're not leaking anything. So I think we're okay.
Now I have no doubt that traction wise, this Suzuki can make it up that hill, but herein lies the rub. This car only has 6.9 inches of ground clearance and eventually I'm going to hit some rock or boulder that's going to tear something out the bottom of this. So while I know I could go farther, I'm not because I want to get home. This is Roman Micah reporting for TFLcar.com. Three cars. One, two, three. Quick guess, which of these three does not belong on this trail? And I have no gun. Just think of the new Jeep Compass as a baby Grand Cherokee. At least from the front. It's got all-wheel drive, it's trail rated, and it goes everywhere a Grand Cherokee will go. Well, almost. Let's take it for a ride and find out. After taking the Compass off-road, here's what I can report. While the new Compass certainly looks 100% better, it's still hamstrung by the CVT or continuously varying transmission. Think of it as one long gear. You know what, you really gotta flog it to get it to go up hills. And just for comparison, here's a Wrangler with the traditional 4-speed automatic going up the same hill. And of course, style, well, that's in the eye of the beholder. I'll let you decide if you like the new look. For 2011, Jeep has freshened up the entire lineup. This is the, the new Jeep Compass for 11. What we've done is put a new front clip on it, and you should see a real definite connection to Grand Cherokee here. So we tried to, to grow it up, move it more towards the Grand Cherokee huh? end of Jeep, and then the Patriot more towards the, the Wrangler end. So, uh, real quickly, it's a new front end, some chrome on it. Uh, we put a band of protective cladding along the bottom. It's now trail rateable, so it's a little sits a little higher. LED tail lamps, new rear fascia, and then some new interior bits on it. Some soft touches, new Jeep steering wheel. Real nice update to it. The good news, you can get the base compass in a five-speed manual. That would be my personal choice. There are also two engine choices, a 158 horsepower 2 liter and a bigger 172 horsepower 2.4 liter unit. Unfortunately, the refresh style, well, that comes at a refresh price. Jeep just announced that the 2011 Compass will start at just over $20,000, which, by the way, is a whopping $4,000 more than the 2010 car. The good news, for the higher price, you get more standard options, and you get the potential of a trail-rated Jeep. Well, well, trail rating is an internal develop uh, process that we use at Jeep, and really it kind of boils down to some key elements of uh, flexibility on the trail, which means articulation, traction, maneuverability, escapability, durability, and, and what we do within each Jeep is we set up really a trail rating package that focuses on those key elements. Yes, as you can probably tell by the sound of cowbells, not music, I'm in Bavaria. I'm Roman Micah, this is TFL Car, behind me is a brand new 2012 Tiguan, and this is a first drive review. While the life cycle of a Volkswagen car is about seven years, for 2012, the Tiguan, as you can tell, it's not all new. It is refreshed, and Volkswagen hopes to offer more value to its core customers. For 2012, we have the new design for the vehicle, so it's the new Volkswagen face. So you can see the, the headlights have been changed. We have the new grill, and then for the U.S. market, we have a new front end, which will be um, like on the, on the red vehicle over there. It's um, kind of a, a really different look to it. We'll continue to have the 2.0-liter TSI, 2.0-liter um, turbo engine that we have today in today's car. Um, and that'll be available um, both in front-wheel drive and all-wheel drive. When you're on the Autobahn, obviously in a 2012 Tiguan, there's only one thing to do. Find out how fast it'll go. Right now I'm doing uh, 100 miles an hour and the speed limit has been lifted, so I'm going to floor it. 
see what the top speed of this car is. And that's 180 kilometers, which is about 120 miles an hour, but oh, we're hitting traffic. There's an Alfa Romeo in front of me, and I have to slow down. So we know it'll do 120. Now, when you're on the Autobahn, a lot of people think that you can go as fast as you want, as often as you want. And the reality of the situation is that when you're around a big city, or it's a Friday afternoon like it is right now, there's just way too much traffic to go all out. Tiguan, how did that come about? Well, there was a, um, there's a very popular uh, German automobile magazine, the Autobild, and um, they had a contest in uh, cooperation with Volkswagen to name the new small SUV. And the name comes from uh, the combination of two words. So Tiger, which in German is Tiger, and Iguana, which in German is Leguan. So the Tiguan is kind of a combination of these two animals. The Tiguan lives in a very competitive class. Think of cars like the RAV4 and the Honda CRV. Right now I'm sitting in the back seat and I'm impressed. I'm 6'2 and there's plenty of room for my feet and for my head, even with this massive panoramic sunroof. I'm driving the diesel right now, and unfortunately we won't get the diesel in the States, which is a shame because this engine is torquey, um, it's fun to drive, and it gets good gas mileage. VW says that they may bring it to the United States, but it really depends on cost. I know in Europe you get uh, diesel. Is that something that you think will come eventually to America? Um, that's something we're looking, uh, you know, very seriously at. That's something we'd like to have. It's just a matter of you know getting it developed and, and making a business case for it. So it won't be coming right away. The thing I like most about the Tiguan is that it has a firm yet controlled ride. It almost feels, and I don't know if I should say this, like a sports car. Which I suppose driving it in these twisty conditions is good. Uh, I'm not sure how that'll feel on America's rough roads. Hey, how you doing? This is Nathan Adlin for TFLcar.com and I'm driving a 2011 Toyota RAV4 uh, off-road. <laughs> yep. In fact, uh, I'm driving the V6 which has 269 horsepower. That's really good. So uh, we're going to see how this baby does off-road. Oh, and um, <laughs> well, hopefully we'll keep it in one piece. As you can see, I'm in a Subaru Forester, and the number three quirk of this Forester, in my mind, is the engine. It's got a 224 turbocharged four-cylinder that's just a gem of an engine. Hey, Nathan, I just realized something. How much does uh, the RAV4 cost? About 31. That's fully loaded. Uh, my Forester is about uh, 31 as well. How many seats? Well, this one only has five. It doesn't have the third row seat option. And it's all-wheel drive, right? It's all-wheel drive. You know what I'm thinking? Look, dude, we got cars that actually compete against each other for whatever. Yeah, yeah, that's not quite the mashup. These guys actually, uh, yeah, people cross shop them. Ain't that a corker? Oh, wow. Well, I guess we'll just have to do a proper review. Proper review. There are three quirks the Toyota RAV4, and number three, horsepower. 269 horsepower, that's really good. Toyota took the largest engine, the 3.5 liter V6, that they could stuff in this car and they put it in there, which was great. 
because frankly it was getting a little old and tired and by putting that huge V6 in here and that much horsepower it is one of the fastest cars in its class. The number two quirky thing about this car, and this is very quirky indeed, is that this car's Gemini engine only comes mated to a four speed, that's right, four speed transmission, automatic transmission. There are cars now that have eight speeds out there and Subaru still building a four speed like 1970. Come on Subaru, this engine needs a lot better transmission to make the best use of its power. Number two, um, and this one a little bit of a downer. Have you seen the way it looks? I mean, it's not ugly, but man, it's been around forever and this is one of the most innocuous crossover SUVs built. Toyota, I know you guys have to, you know, get it all together for styling and everything else and go through a whole committee, but you gotta do it faster. This car's been around for a long time and it's way past its prime, at least in terms of looks. Number one quirk, Uno, of this car is, it's just honest, it is what it is, it's not pretentious. This Subaru says to you, I'm here, I'm ready to take you and your family to wherever you're going, perhaps not in the highest of style, but certainly I'm gonna get you there safely and dependably. And that is quirky, and that is very good. The number one quirk, um, Got tons of space. I mean, this is one of the roomiest, most logically set up crossovers in its class. I put my whole family in here. I put a really fat cousin in here. Oh no, and a really fat aunt too. They all fit. They all fit in this thing. And you know what? Not many cars can say that. And definitely not many crossovers. Good headroom too. All right, so those are the top three quirks for each car, but which one's a better car? I guess we'll have to find out. You know how we do that, don't you? Yeah. All right, let's swap. Yeah, all right. All right, Super let's go. WRX. <laughs> right four time. Let's do it. Yeah, there's a turbo in this one. Oh yeah, yeah, I know what Nathan's talking about. This engine is fast and this car is powerful, but, and this is a big but, the steering is kind of, well. I hate to say this, nondescript, vague. It just doesn't feel like it engages you. It doesn't feel like you want to take this car and just whip it around these corners. It feels like you want to take it to a, oh, this is a cliche, but I'm gonna say it, a soccer game. Yeah, yeah, it's okay, it's reliable, it's dependable, but fun, well, in a straight line for sure. Turbocharged engines rock. They do, I mean, especially when you're high up here like in Boulder, Colorado. Here's the thing. The Toyota RAV4 is a great car. It's just totally practical, it makes sense, it's economical, and that V6 is pretty powerful. But this is the car you drive. The Toyota is the car you ride in. Big difference. And you know what? When it comes to seating, comfort, even the interior layout, Subaru is just a better car. Yeah, I have to agree, except for the freaking four speed transmission. Yeah, come on, Subaru. Come on, you gotta get rid of that. So, if you got $30,000 that you want to part with, we highly recommend both cars, but the one that's more fun, more engaging, is certainly the Subaru Forester. This is Roman Micah and my cohort in crime, Nathan Adlin. As always, reporting for TFLcar.com. Now we know that Nathan fits in the Toyota because it is a family car, but the question is, yes indeed, does Nathan fit with a stroller? Stroller? 
I fit. Here's the thing, a lot of room. This door, the way it opens, Toyota, you gotta stop doing that. We can't have that anymore. It blocks traffic, you park at a curb, you don't see, you fall over, Junior falls out of the stroller, it's a disaster. Yeah, I fit. So yeah, Nathan fits in the RAV4, but does he fit in the Forester? And perhaps more importantly, does he fit in the Forester with all the stuff my family needs to travel. Nathan, do you fit? I pretty much fit. You, you couldn't put me in the Toyota with all this junk. You had to put me in the smaller Subaru. Say bye, Nathan. Oh, come on. Bye. You fit. Bye. I fit. I fit. I fit.